Welcome to another episode of the Reboot Chronicles, a no holds barred forum with global leaders, authors, entrepreneurs, and CEOs about how organizations stay focused on growth and innovation in unprecedented times. I'm your host, Dean DeBias, coming to you live from Revive's North American headquarters in Chicago, and we would like to thank you for joining us from around the globe today. I'd like to welcome Chris Todd to the Reboot Chronicles. He is the CEO of UKG, a leading provider of HR, payroll, and workforce management solutions. The three now going to $4 billion annual revenue company is consistently ranked as one of the best places to work with about 15,000 employees serving over 75,000 organizations in 100 countries around the world. Pretty impressive. Now one of the largest private companies or private software companies in the world. They've just had a couple of quarters where they hit a billion dollars in revenue, which is very impressive. Chris, it's good to see you. Thank you, Dean. Happy to be here today. Yeah, we've been looking forward to talking to you. It's always yeah, fun, always, always fun to talk to private companies versus public ones. And having run both of them, I prefer to be in your seat. Um, you guys have gotten really big, really fast. And maybe um, I was going to jump right into you and your leadership style because I really like it. It's why we invited you. But maybe just to start out, let's just talk about how you guys got here. You know, the original merger with Kronos and Ultimate and, sure. um, and then up to the uh, great place to work um, acquisition as well and Michael Bush and all that stuff. So uh, maybe just take us through that journey. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here today. Um, proud of the UKG story and everything that we've been able to do and excited to Good have one. the opportunity talk about it a little bit. Um, you, you're right that UKG is a, it's a newer company, right? It's a, it's a newer brand, uh, which resulted from the merger of Kronos Incorporated and Ultimate Software. And both Kronos and Ultimate Software were companies, very established software companies that are a couple decades old, right? Combined sort of 30, 70 years of experience. Ultimate was about 30 years old and Kronos was about you're 40 like an years old. old school startup. <laughs> we are an old school startup. And we, you know, we maybe a different conversation for a different day, but we started um, the work to merge the two companies in late 2019. We announced the merger of Kronos and Ultimate Software in the third week of February 2020, at which point for us, <laughs> COVID was a small supply chain issue as it related to, yeah. uh, you know, a little bit of hardware we, do, we build, which is a very small part of our business. And, and then March 12th, we sent all the employees home and then we merged, uh, you know, sort of formally and sort of launched the merger on April 1st, 2020. And so we took two organizations, both of whom had 6,000 employees at the time and merged them during COVID, right? Having every single conversation like this. <laughs> and you can imagine what it was like, you know, for me and for everyone else trying to meet 6,000 new people. Um, through this medium, right? Very difficult, very challenging, a lot of extra work, a lot of time. Um, but we're really proud of, of what we've done and how we were able to do it. And and we were both, both Kronos and Ultimate were companies that were very serious about their culture. Um, both yep. companies historically have been all over great place to work lists. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but we knew that the new culture for UKG would be different, right? UKG was going to need to be different than what Ultimate was and was going to need to be different than what Kronos was. And so we worked behind the scenes. We worked more on culture and branding and employee messaging than anything else uh, because we knew that we needed to land that in the beginning. And we landed on our purpose as people as our tagline. Uh, it worked, right? It resonated with the employees immediately and, and allowed the employees to begin to look forward, right? Part of what we knew we were going to have to get through, uh, as I said, Kronos was amazing, Ultimate was amazing, but we needed to show all the employees that UKG was going to be amazing. It's going to be different than what they had before, but similarly amazing um, and worth continuing to invest in, in terms of their time and careers and energy and enthusiasm and everything that goes with that. Um, and that was a big part of it, right? That was the yeah, you know, right. I know we're on the, you know, we're here to talk about reboots, and that was the like the original reboot for UKG. Yeah, and most people forget about the people. <laughs> so, you know, the leadership right. kind of says, "Well, we got to get this thing, put this together." Having bought and sold a lot of companies, I've been on the good end and the bad end of that. And it's usually the it's the, the culture smash doesn't always work. Sold one company to Salesforce that. Um, you know, the culturally, it was great at first. Um, sold another couple of companies to, you know, big multi-billion dollar conglomerates that they just, you know, they just squashed them. So they can I mean, get lost. It probably yeah. helped that you were both the same size, similar. It did help a little bit that we were the same size. And ironically, I think COVID helped us, right? It made the, 
It made the integration more challenging. It, it for sure slowed down the efforts to meet new people, make them new comfort, make them more comfortable. Hmm. But it was a very obvious time for companies all over the world to lean into their employees and 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 really put energy and enthusiasm behind protecting their employees. And so, given we merged, you know, as I said, 18 days after we sent everyone home, um, and our our employee brand promise was our purpose as people. The fact that we sort of had this 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 sort of global pandemic and we were able to lean into the employees right away, preserve their jobs, take care of them, take care of their families, support them, given the challenges that they were going through, I think, as I said, ironically, gave us an opportunity to, to prove the case right out of the blocks, which which helped us. It, it gave us a baseline that then we were able to build upon. And you had two cultures. You had a Boston culture and a Florida culture. Is that, is that fair to say? That's true. Right. It's true. Um, we um, uh, Kronos was headquartered here in Lowell, Massachusetts, where I'm sitting today, and Ultimate Software was headquartered in, in Western Florida, slightly west of Fort Lauderdale. Yep. So, you know, we had New England, we had South Florida, you're right, two completely different cultures. Um, one of them hugged more than another. Um, but um, all the Boston folks are getting used to hugging and all the Florida folks are getting used to uh, sort of bad weather. Oh, and wow. the air, right. <laughs> um, but, uh, beyond that, we've sort of pushed through. And, and part of part of what we did early on, uh, which we've maintained today, is, is we have a dual headquarters strategy. And so yep. we maintain the headquarters in Lowell and in West End. For all the obvious reasons, it was it was important to uh, both organizations to to you know celebrate the history, but more but but more than that, you know we're a software company and our intellectual property, you know, and and the brains of the outfit actually walks out the door every single night, and uh, we wanted to make sure we sent a signal to all the employees that they were important and they were valued and a big part of the UKG story. Yeah, the um, you know for those that don't know you, your your whole people passion thing. It's not just a merger slogan or, or an edict. It was, it's also your personality, which is, which is great. And I just wrote a couple of Forbes articles on what I teach with Kellogg, which is, you know, or, or at least in how we actually reboot companies, forget about teaching. And it, mm-hmm. we, it's focused on people, platform, and passion. And the, the, you get the two bookends, the, the platform sure. is usually what takes up all the time, which is the product, right. the product roadmap and the partnerships and the sales and the ARR. And oh my gosh, the sky is falling. All the yeah. middle ground. How do you how do you balance all that? And it's nice to be people culture and all that, but you're also delivering some pretty hefty quarters, right? Right. Um, yeah. It's, it's good question. We. Um, I try. I, yeah, I think those were the. Um, um, those really were the. I think those are the right pl- three platforms for sure, um, or the right three categories to think about. And when we think about the platform. Yeah. It's one of the reasons the merger made so much sense was that we we both companies came into this was true with truly complementary product sets and platform sets. And so the the work behind the scenes to figure out how to bring Ulti Pro um, and how to bring Workforce Central and Workforce Dimensions together in an intellectual sense was quite simple. Technically, you know, it's it's a you know, it's something we've been working on for a couple of years. Sure. Um, but but how to do that work and what we wanted to do. Didn't take much long to figure, much time to figure out at all, which then gave us a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of intellectual bandwidth to deal with the people side of it and to deal with the the um, process side of it. And the people side of it was important to us because of the cultures that we came from, because we wanted um, the Kronos and Ultimate employees to be excited about the new UKG, but also as a company that that had staked its claim on being one of the leading cultures in the world selling solutions to HR and operations professionals who also want to lead their organizations into having fantastic cultures. It's deeply strategic for us to focus on culture, right? It makes us a better place to work. It makes us an employer choice. It encourages people to want to spend their um, their careers with us. But at the same time, we fundamentally believe that in a strategic sense, it gives us better insight into, pro- into the products and services that we're delivering exactly. to our customers all over the world. And that's part of our promise is that the energy that we put into culture will manifest itself in the products and, and solutions that they purchase from us. Yeah. It'll enable them to be more successful too. Yeah. I was going to go with the, that merger forced you to like blend these two platforms. Not easy, but that's probably nope. made, made you more of an open, not open source, but open platform to plug in all types of different partners and other products and services on top of your platform, which some companies aren't that great at actually some don't want to do that. Like uh, if you right. look at something like Zoho, they're not really doing a lot of that. They're not acquiring. So you, um, 
And then on top of that, you picked up a great place. Um, yeah. but you just kept acquiring it. Is that where right. you? Is, so, so you, I just figured this out. So, UKG is Ultimate Chronos and Great. Is that is that UKG? Is that no, how? That, that's a that's that's. Uh, I wish we were that it had that much foresight. Um, um, U and K and G is Ultimate Chronos Group. Yeah. Um, and then about a year and a half ago, we acquired. Now about a year and three quarters ago, we acquired the company Great Place to Work. We acquired the great company, great place to work for a number of reasons. It was, um, again, for us, our purpose is people and being a great place to work. It's on brand for sure. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a great business in and of itself, um, which just makes us sort of, uh, sort of bigger and more successful. But beyond that, what we were able to, the, the, so the true intellectual property behind great place to work, which was so interesting to us, is all the data. Um, and all of the um, all of the sort of use cases as to sort of what separates a great place to work from a not so great place to work and right. um, having the access to the data, which allows us to, to, again, sort of deliver those sorts of solutions through our products um, that we offer to all of our customers. And so we are we as an organization are continuing to lean in more and more and more behind this notion of being a great place to work. We want to be a great place to work for all, and we want to enable all organizations to be great places to work. The brand helps, the data helps, the methodology helps, the people helps. And so it's been a real accelerant for us um, uh, on that journey. And in fact, later this fall, we're going to release our first product, sort of branded great place to work. And it's a diversity, equity and inclusion hub, uh, which will be an, a different, an additional part of the, you know, the HR and workforce management suite that we offer that will allow companies not only to go on their DE and I journeys, but to understand how they're doing and to benchmark themselves against others and uh, to access the great place to work um, intellectual assets to learn how to do it and how to be more effective and how to you know how to have challenging conversations or courageous conversations with your employees on and on and so we think it's a great way to continue to expand our human capital management suite lean into the great place to work methodology and brand and data and enable our customers to go on this important journey in a way that's, that's meaningfully different than they've been able to do so before. Yeah. I like the data angle. I mean, if you look at something like ADP and they've got employment data, I mean, they've got an index. Um, you guys can come out more on the qualitative side of this, which I think is, uh, is fascinating. When well, we, people. we have that data as well. In fact, we, um, we go toe to toe with ADP now um, and the federal government in terms of our insight um, into you know how employers are doing, and it's um, it, it's actually something for all the obvious reasons we really leaned into at the beginning of COVID when we were trying to figure out um, what was happening with the economy, and we have access to the payroll data, same level of payroll data that ADP has, not as much payroll data, but sort of equally predictive. Uh, but we've also we also have data that we think is even pre more predictive and earlier than payroll data, because we're the world's leader leader in workforce management solutions. Right. Um, which is you know if you sort of think at the most basic level is sort of time and attendance, people punching in, punching out, working shifts, seeing their schedules, um, and and tens of millions of employees interact with our workforce management solutions every day. We actually know at a punch level, at a shift level how much people are working by region, by industry, by size company. And we know that a week or two or a month before people get paid because people work before they get paid, exactly. which has given us fantastic insight to where the economy is going. And so, in fact, we were on CNBC this morning and, and continuing to actually work with the federal government in ways that um, ideally we can help the Bureau of Labor Statistics to be even more predictive than they've been in the past. I think it's smart. It needs to be triangulated because the, the old dog yeah. data, the old dog data just to me is not as helpful as it used to be. It's not. Especially, no, it's, it's, especially coming no, out of COVID. It's just a bunch of exaggerations. You're it, right. It's, it's you're right. Yeah. It, the data is late and, and because of the COVID effect, right, the data is still really bouncy, yeah. right? And it's hard for people to, it's hard for people to interpret. So when you look at uh, the other thing we measure a lot is uh, what I call BBB, build by borrow. So you, in terms of the platform, right? So you're right. you're clearly, you know, buying. You know how to acquire. Um, in terms of building your own stuff and borrowing partnerships, um, what? Uh, how do you guys, how do you balance that? This product roadmap, yeah. product roadmap. Yeah. Stuff. Not without getting too geeky, but you know. <laughs> right. No, but that and that's the right trade off. And as we do our annual strategy reviews every year. Uh, when we think about where we want to take our platform, that's exactly the analysis that we 
that we go through. And you're right. Historically, we've been a company that has been acquisitive and is, is, is uh, we think, pretty effective at integrating um, yep. sort of new companies and new pieces of technology. Um, that said, you know, in order to have great products and to be a leader, we have to build great products as well. And so we have, a, um, um, you know, an engineering organization that's 5,000 people large, and, and we've invested two and a half billion dollars in R&D over the past five years. And that continues to grow every year. And, and a significant portion of that, of that R&D budget is ex- explicitly allocated toward new features and innovation every single year. Um, in order to in order for us to keep the platforms moving and to continue to invest in areas like the DE and I hub that I just referenced, so that we continue to to be a leader in the human capital management space, um, and then borrowing if sort of borrowing is code for open platform partnerships. That's an important part of our strategy as well. Yeah, I, had to, I had to use a B, so yeah, that's what no, it, yeah, yeah. I get it. And we um, that's been a core part of of. Uh, how the products have been designed and how they've worked for years. We have about 250 technology partners and as much as, and as much as we're sort of proud of the solutions that we have and love our human capital management and workforce management solutions. um, We are aware that, that organizations do need, you know, they need supply chain software, financial software, other, um, other products to run their businesses in order to be effective. It needs to be open. right? Right. And they need to be able to, to, to sort of work with multiple vendors in order to, satisfy the needs of their organization and to be great employers, which we want them to be. And, and I wish we had a corner in the market on all of the world's great ideas, but we don't. And, and having an open platform allows us to, to sort of access those ideas and um, sometimes generate a little bit more revenue, but more often than not, just make the customers a little bit more successful and happier. And sometimes moving faster. I mean, most companies, big and small, they would like to buy, you know, more products from less vendors, just to simplify right. life. So you're seeing a move to that. Everything from Salesforce to Intuit to Zoho to, I mean, even ADP is, you know, the big dog, the old dogs, I call them. Um, you know, you got no, oh, this is why I brought this up, from a competitiveness standpoint. When you try to reboot the whole competitiveness angle, sometimes, you know, we get a little too excited about our own products and services. And um, right. so how do you, how do you, how do you stand up? I usually ask, who do you, who do you hate? I think I know right. vendors you hate, <laughs> your competitors. But yeah, how do, you, how do you be more competitive over the next few years in this, uh, yeah. this space? Because there's a land grab going on, it seems. Yeah, there, there is. And we, um, we've, we focus on this in a couple different directions. One is the, the area that I highlighted earlier. We make sure that we allocate a meaningful portion of our engineering billion is a lot that's amazing yeah but but specifically toward innovation um you know to your to your uh, taxonomy sort of using the word borrow our open um our open platform and having a couple hundred partners does allow us to get insight into where the market's moving um where people are innovating that we might not have thought of at the time it for sure gives us real insight into what the venture what the venture community is funding and how they're thinking about the markets. And we spend a lot of time, I spend a lot of time um, uh, sort of with startups, thinking about startups, trying to figure out where they're going and, and making sure that we're, we're sort of remaining sort of competitively viable and, and remaining a, a, a sort of leader in our space. And so said differently, you know, Kronos was once a very small company. Ultimate was once a very small company and now we're a large company Um, and so we worry a lot about those really small companies and what they're doing and pay a lot of attention to them. Um, because that's, as you know, that's where, that's where innovation and disruption comes from. Exactly. And, um, you know, now, now you're part of the problem. You're, you're over, you know, (laughs) once you start heading to 4 billion, it's like, okay, you're one of the big dogs. And, um, I run this program called dancing with startups, which helps large corporations partner with startups all over the world, whether they're doing build, buy or borrow, who knows, but yeah, having a, I'm so glad you brought it up. So I don't have to get into it with you, but having a process to do that for big companies, I'd just say over a billion, you want to start doing that. Um, it, it can't be a hobby. It needs to be a, um, you know, part, part of the DNA. And it sounds like the way you've set, set it up, it's, it fits in well. Because it, it, doesn't seem I mean, like, it doesn't seem like you've lost your smallness. It seems like you, you still have it. For, I mean, for us, that's actually, I mean, we have specific, the, the, the sort of what I just outlined for you, like that is a, it's a group of people with a specific leader and a budget. Um, and they lead sort of, you know, hackathons and programs for, the smaller companies that we partner with so that we can work well with one another, learn from one another, 
Um, I mean, if it, we, we, we sort of spend a lot of time with them, invest in them quite a bit and encourage them to spend time with us. And it benefits both of us for sure. And you're right. It has to be a, um, um, has to be a core part of the DNA. And I would like to think that we've maintained an element of our smallness. We're a big place. Um, but as I like to say, people don't survive here unless they do real work, right? Yeah. I have a, you know, I'm a CEO and that has a certain title to it and a certain ring to it. But at the same time, um, I answer all my own emails. I do dozens of customer calls every month. Um, you know, I did two customer calls today. Of course. Um, and I've been, I've been here 16 years, right? I have lots of customer relationships that I've just developed over the years, but, but those matter. And having that sort of granular tactile sense of what the customers are doing, what they think of the products, how they're using them um, is meaningful to running the business for sure. Um, and to, to some of the elements that you were sort of referencing a couple minutes ago helps us to keep a sense of where the market's headed yep. and, and, you know, how our buyers are thinking about areas that they're investing in where they're spending the money as well. Especially if you're global, you know, some companies, yeah. they're just focused on the States and you guys need to be so many cylinders. You have to hit it on at the same time. Well, can't use it. Yeah. Can't use the car analogy there. Cause there's too many of them. Um, right. So how did this all go for you personally? 16 years is a long time. Um, it is. The previous CEO, uh, Aaron, I think was your mentor and coach. And he was. Yep. And, uh, takes credit for everything you do, probably. <laughs> and he deserves it. I'm kidding. No. So, yeah. So what? tell us about that a little bit, about the personal side of your journey and, you know, becoming a big time CEO. Yeah, it's um, I joined I joined Kronos in 2007. Um, uh, previous, I uh, was at a company called Blackbaud in Charleston, South Carolina. I'd been there for no seven problem. years sure. and um, had, a, had a wonderful time there. And um, I fundamentally have had, I, I've sort of said this sort of many, many times before, I've, I've basically had two managers in the last 23 years and I hit the manager lottery. Um, I loved the CEO at Blackbaud, a guy named Bob Sawalski. Yeah, um, he was Tremendous mentor to me in the early 2000s, still a close personal friend. I last talked to him a couple of weeks ago. Um, and then Aaron, and then Bob retired and um, I started to look around a little bit and landed at Kronos. And, and, and in the end, well, in the beginning, sort of ended at Kronos, I was attracted to the business and the market opportunity and all of that. But I also really liked Aaron and I thought he would be a great manager and I thought he would be a great mentor to me. Um, by the way, he he was then and is now a completely different personality than Bob. And I thought that would be helpful. And um, to me, as I sort of continue to sort of think about my leadership path, and it was. And uh, as I said, I made a big bet on Bob once upon a time and I won. And then I made a big bet on Aaron once upon a time and I won. Um, and Aaron and I have worked hand in hand for the last 16 years since the summer, summer 2007. And it's been amazing. I mean, just incredible mentor. He's invested thousands and thousands and thousands of hours in me. Um, and at this point, he's like, you know, he's much more than a mentor and a coworker. He's a deep personal friend. Um, and and also, he's also still exec chairman, right? Yeah, he's still the exec chairman. You know, we talk multiple times a week. Um, and we worked on this. We worked on the CEO transition for four years. Wow. Um, which, which may be a record for these transitions, but most people, enabled, most people are like four weeks. That's amazing. But it enabled us to be, um, really well prepared, um, as individuals, it allowed us to be, um, to sort of prep the organization for the changes that were coming such that when we announced it, um, and I mean this in a good way, I think across the organization, it was a giant shrug. Um, and, huh. um, um, and it allowed us to, and and I think this is something that isn't sort of thought about or talked about enough. It allowed us to sort of be sensitive to one another as we are going through that journey, right? It's a it's a big change for me for all the obvious reasons, but also a big change for Aaron. And um, it allowed us the time and the space to um, invest in one another's journeys and make sure that we really understood one another's journeys. And I think one thing that I'll give us both enormous credit for others will judge how the business does. Mm -hmm. um, but we did a fantastic job sort of taking care of one another through the journey um, and checking in with one another and making sure that um, he set me up for success as CEO. I think I set him up for success um, as exec chairman um, and, you know, as I've said multiple times and he said multiple, there's more than enough work to go around. There's more than enough credit to yeah. go around. And, um, if and we can continue to 
share that, then that's fantastic. And then folks, it doesn't always go that way. I've seen, you know, I've seen it where someone takes over and the, you know, the old guard just doesn't want to let go or, cause you had to come in and reboot things. I mean, you, you didn't just sit around and watch, right. you didn't just magically get to a $4 billion or a $1 billion quarter or two. Uh, you had to do some hard things, but what, what were some of the tough changes you had to make? Well, you know, yeah, I mean, there are a whole a whole bunch comes with it, right? One benefit of of having the time that we had was we were able to sort of do the work on the executive team that we needed that that was going to happen sort of prior to the announcement. And so, because this was so long in coming, I was fortunate to be able to come into the job with the whole team knew this was going to happen, and they were sort of prepped and ready and up for the next journey. Um, and that allowed us to um, sort of launch forward as a team immediately. But um, you have to do the things that you you know you have to do in the beginning. You do have to remake the executive team. Um, you got to meet remake the rhythm of the business a little bit. Exactly. Um, yep. We we sort of change our investment profile as a business. We um, refocused on some products. We we sort of focused a little bit less on some other products. So changed the portfolio mix a little. Um, made an acquisition, you know, so continue to be active in the M&A markets as we sort of reshape the portfolio. So um, got a couple new board members along the way. So a lot going on. Yeah. 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 That's why I always start with people. I mean, people platform passion just sounds cute, but it's the, the people that got you to, you know, a $900 million company are not always the ones that are going to get you to a six, seven, eight billion dollar company which seems like uh, where you're, where you're headed. And that, right. It seems evident, um, but it, it's hard to do. And it's, uh, it's a challenging, it's a challenging journey for sure. And, and as an organization, we went through that, right. Both ultimate and Kronos on their own were about 1.4, $1.5 billion companies. And then right. magically we all woke up one morning and worked for a $3 billion company. And as I said over and over again, like to, unless you happen to have worked for somewhere else, no one here had ever worked at a $3 billion company. And so we have to figure it out. <laughs> and now we're hurting past four and heading toward five. And um, we do need to develop new skills and, um, and new processes and um, new platforms to continue to support the organization going forward. Um, historically, we've been good at having those conversations, though, right? Where part of our purpose as people is we do, we care for one another, we take care of one another, uh, which allows people to have the emotional space to be honest about how they're feeling and what they want to do, which, which helps us as we go through these transitions as a, as a business. I bet. And when you look at the market and the competitiveness, you know, over the next few years, what are you most excited about in terms of a growth and innovation track? You know, whether you're extending into something new, maybe new markets, yeah. new products, new services, new geographies, what, 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 uh, what are you most excited about? Yeah, we're excited about, uh, we're excited about a couple different areas well, there are, um, um, fantastic opportunities for us to continue to invest globally and build our business globally. And so you're going to see us um, sort of expand our presence outside with, with sort of products specifically sort of outside uh, the United States and Canada. And that's exciting for us. And it's going to sound like a little bit of a cliche given everything you've been hearing since last fall. Um, but we're really excited about, you know, AI and large language models and what those might allow us to bring to bear, both in terms of allowing us to offer sort of different, differentiated, more exciting, more meaningful products to our customers, while allowing us to invest in our own operations internally and deliver more effective service. Right? Exactly. Yeah, I was going to ask you about healthcare AI um, before we ran out of time and uh, kind of got sidetracked on the people stuff, which was actually fascinating. Um but you have so many verticals to focus on. The impact yeah. that AI can make is that's that's a lot of work for you guys. How do you how do you <laughs> prioritize that? It's right. like some companies just focus on one vertical, and that's enough. So AI right. comes in, throws a wrench in things. Um, right, both good men. Yeah, you know, what's your yeah? Thought? We you know we have we have big presence in retail and healthcare and manufacturing and services and distribution and public sector. It's part of the strength of the um, of the business. But we. Um, um, so our stated strategy, which we're we're executing on, and we think we can and uh, we can we can deliver, is that um, we believe there's there's sort of a platform of work that we can do um, in this area that will be applicable across all the verticals. And you sort of think of that as like the first layer of the cake, right? Um, and then there's a a second layer of the cake, which may be related to time, may be related to scheduling, um, will have some vertical flavors to it that that um, 
Uh, we think without an without a sort of an inordinate amount of extra effort, we can verticalize those solutions. And so think of those as um, sort of models built with AI, LLM technology that are specific for the space that we're in, human capital management and workforce management. And then the top layer of the cake is allowing our individual customers to interact with those models, you know, to introduce their data um, and in ways that are going to be effective for their operations or whatever it is they're trying to do. And so we think we've got a, a, a sort of bead on those first two layers of the cake and we'll see where we can get to with the third layer and allowing customers to sort of interact in a, you know, back toward us and sort of create a bi-directional impact here. Yeah. Well said. Without unpacking it, we could unpack that for an hour. Right. We could. So um, I uh, really want to thank you for uh, joining us today, uh, Chris. Any parting words for people, um, young leaders who uh, want to grow up and do what you do? I mean, they don't always have two best mentors in the world. They don't always have. Yeah. What, uh, what, what, what would you tell them? I think the um, good. I mean, there's so much I could share, but I, I think the what has served me well is um, continuing to remember that it's not about me. Um, um, this is about it's about the company, um, but more than the company, it's about the people who work here and the impact that we're able to have on them and their families and their lives and their communities. And um, the impact that we're able to have on our customers um, and which will enable them to have impacts on their lives and their families and their communities. And, and that's, that's what we want to do. And we're in a really fortunate position. I'm in a really fortunate position where uh, if, if I do my job well, if we do our job well, we're enabling people to have meaningful work and meaningful work is meaningful. And, and by that, I mean people who have meaningful work are better connected to their communities. They're better connected to their families. Um, and, and I've always believed and continue to believe that that has a positive sort of butterfly, impact, butterfly effect on all of us. And that's what motivates me. And that's what gets me going every single day. And um, it's the you crewers who excite me. And it's the, the lives that they're leading that excite me. And when I combine that with the products that we get to deliver and the impact that I know it has on the um, on the organizations that we serve, that's great. Yeah, um, that's and, great. and, and having a, having something that's sort of deeply meaningful, um, can propel a person and maybe you end up in a role like this. Maybe you don't. Um, but at the, it, but if a person sort of goes on that journey to figure out what's meaningful to them, they'll end up doing something that's personally important and that's enough. Well said. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. You've been listening to Chris Todd, who's the CEO of UKG. Check him out. This is Dean Tobias with the Reboot Chronicles. I want to thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you soon.